All right, I want to know who all is dancing in your chair right now. <laughs> Great that, choice, Deb. That song is in honor of Colonel Mustard tonight as a stray cat. <clears throat> so that's why I chose that song. <laughs> Any of you guys up here on the stage know when that was written? I had to look it up. I'm betting in the 70s. Old, right? 1981. Wow. Okay. I thought older. That, that, that <laughs> I, I actually thought I thought older too, actually, but it's yeah. not. All right, Carol, I'm going to let you take it away. Well, thank you, Brittany, for joining us again tonight, and Deb and Karen, of course, for manning the stage here and calling people up. So Brittany was on a few weeks ago, but I had to be, I forget where I was, but I was not here. And so I didn't get to ask her all the questions that I like to ask and the things that I like to talk about with the people that are part of our crew here. I know when, um, one of the things that is my like claim to fame is that when I want to do something, I'll figure out how to do it. And then as soon as I'm pretty sure that I can make it work, I start looking for somebody that can take it over so that I can move to the next thing. And so I had been working really hard to build up a presence on Amazon.com because we just didn't have t-shirts on Amazon that had really good cat prints. And so there were a number of artists in our community who started drawing cats for us that we could put on, talk about cat style, that we could put on to t-shirts and such. And then um, we also had a Amazon store that I had set up and was trying to make profitable. And so for the first year, year and a half, it, it was a real struggle, but it was finally looking like it might actually break even. And at that point, I was ready to hand it off to somebody. And Jamie was telling me that Brittany might be looking for a job. And I thought, well, that would be perfect because Brittany is an artist and she is really good with and when I say that, I mean in photography. Um, she's really good at, and I didn't know this at the time, but she's really good at coming up with creative um, descriptions for products and describing the products and really putting things in their best light because in her uh, real world job, and I'll t have her tell you about her job if she didn't talk about much about that previously, she was doing that kind of work. And so she came in and took over the Amazon store but as most of you know, we had to drop the Amazon store because Amazon was competing with all of their small vendors. And so making it just really difficult for somebody as small as us to, to provide the same kind of profits and such. So Brittany, when, you, when I met you, you were doing photography for like a travel agency or something, wasn't it? Yeah, it was, uh, so it was vacation rentals. Um, there were multiple companies here in uh, like the St. Pete Clearwater area and they would send me out to condos and I'd have to stage them and take all the photography and then go home and upload all of the images and basically create Airbnb pages, um, TripAdvisor listings, um, all of those various things online. So I was basically selling vacations to people <laughs> um, on all of the various travel sites for, uh, I think it was like three or four different um, companies in the area, mostly like husband and wife duo teams that were, you know, trying to make money by um, being property managers, essentially. So, yep, that's what I was doing prior. I, I really have a huge benefit that when we do have a paid position, I have so many amazing volunteers to select from. And so you had been a volunteer long before you came on as a staff member. When did you first start volunteering? Yeah, so Mark and I moved down in 2015 and started um, volunteering. And then I was a volunteer for a little over three years uh, before I became a staff member. And you were already now a I'm creature. coming up on four years as a staff member. It's craziness. <laughs> wow. You were already a green shirt by then, right? I was, yeah. Yep. And so that was another thing that really helps is if she's going to take photographs of the cats and such to use as uh, backdrops for any of the artwork that she's doing, she needed to be able to get close, to, close enough to all of those cats. 
And then you took over and really grew the number of artists and the connections with artists. Can you talk about what that was like trying to herd cats in that way? <laughs> definitely, yeah. I mean, um, you definitely had a good a good basis of people that were doing like you know one or two designs, and then we just we'd never hear back from them, unfortunately. So I just started. Uh, specifically in the Facebook group um, for Big Cat Rescue, as well as on our Instagram, just making shout outs daily. Like, are you a talented artist who wants to donate your creativity to the cats? And, you know, I'd get each time I would post something like that, I'd get one or two people that reach out and kind of ask questions. How does that work? Um, I would say, though, we've we really lucked out finding somebody like Natalie um, Powell, who you know, is just so talented and she she has probably given us the most designs at this point, but we're just always always reaching out and kind of answering questions to people like, you know, hey, you know, if you can't financially so you know, uh, donate to the cats or things like that, doing things with creativity just as beneficial because I can turn those into products and then we sell those and then that money goes to the cats. So um, yeah, it's been, it's just been a lot of networking and I go around Instagram a lot and I leave comments on people and I'm like, wow, that's really amazing. Ever want to donate a, a design? Contact me, like things like that. So, um, yeah, we're, we're lucky that we've got quite a few people that, uh, have wanted to do that, uh, as a way of helping the cats. And even though we had to close down the Amazon store and I don't think we do the Amazon t-shirts, the print on demand, do we? No, nope, that all kind of went down at, at once. Um, was that so right around we, COVID or was it before? Uh, it was like, I, I want to say it was a couple weeks after like we officially closed the doors. Um, we started running numbers on, you know, what what's kind of not giving us as much of a return. Um, and then you guys had actually shortly before COVID turned over the entire, Jamie had turned over the entire Shopify store to me and had told me I could start putting all those designs that we had been using on Amazon on Shopify since we've already, you know, had that established and going. So that's kind of when we made the decision like, well, okay, I guess we don't need the same design in three different places. Let's just cancel. I think it was Amazon merch is what was different from our FBA and FBM um, Amazon fulfillment store. So. And nobody could really appreciate how hard it is to run Amazon Merch and Amazon FBA (laughs) until they've done it. And it is the most mind-numbingly difficult thing in the world I think I've ever done. It was gruesome, yeah. (laughs) I felt really sad that it didn't work out. But I also, it was kind of a huge relief. I know for Gail as well, because poor Gail, just trying to keep up with the numbers on that thing. We were both always like pulling out our hair, like trying to figure it all out. Because you're right, Amazon definitely was basically competing against us and making it super difficult to to make a profit for the cats. So we can do that on our own Shopify store, then great. (laughs) So that's that's what we've been doing. And I know it was like two years later, they were still charging us every month for the store and not letting us shut the store down because Mm -hmm. they lost one of our bracelets and they couldn't just get rid of it and we couldn't make them get rid of it. It was just like, (laughs) I am just going to lose my mind over this. Yep. <laughs> but I didn't realize that I knew you took over the uh, our main store, the bigcatrescue.biz, but I had thought that it was after COVID when we all took on extra jobs because I had to let go of so many people. So it's interesting that you had already taken that on before that. Yeah, it was it was probably just a few weeks honestly prior because Jamie was going to start focused, you know, focusing more on a lot of the maintenance things and she just kind of needed that a little bit more off her plate. And so um that kind of started becoming mine and then it at rapid speed after. <laughs> So. And I love what you have done with it. I mean, you've just, you've really made it beautiful. And the newsletters and um, ads that you send out are just fantastic. And now I know you're working with Katie to do that to an even bigger list. But anybody who gets those emails, I, I can't imagine that people throw them away like I do so many of those shopping things that come to me because they always look so cool. Yeah, cute cute cat photos always help. <laughs> <laughs> Well, speaking of cute cats, I understand that you have a cute cat in your life. Tell us about Colonel Mustard. 
Oh, Lord. Yes. The the story of the Colonel Mustard. Um, yeah, total fish out of water on this one. But I'm I've really become thankful of the last three years of being in the rehab program because all of those things have come in really handy at this point. Um, basically, at the end of 2020, Mark and I uh, sold our house in St. Pete and moved into a new one. And we have this like basically the neighbors say it used to be like part of a garage or like a workshop and then the people before us converted it into like sort of like a mother-in-law suite or like a pool house or you know something it's kind of small but it's got like a kitchen and a bathroom and a bedroom and things like that and we were hoping to get it set up for like friends and family that would come stay or luckily we lucked out and one of our friends actually rents it from us so it was this awesome like income property opportunity and when we moved in we noticed uh, which by the way all the flagstone that you and Howard pulled up from your house that is the walkway to this house so (laughs) (laughs) so when we were landscaping and we were moving all of that stone Um, we noticed that it looked like somebody had definitely burrowed and dug to live underneath that, um, structure. And at the time I didn't know if it was like raccoons or, cause we definitely live in an area where it's a little more country, uh, vibe than our old house. And so we see a lot of new random animals (laughs) and, so first couple of weeks, we didn't think much about it. We filled in all the holes we landscaped. And then we just kind of started noticing this, like, gray, male, like, kind of beat-up-looking stray cat hanging around. And he would come and go, and, like, we'd see him for a day or so. He'd just be, like, lounging around, you know, the yard. But if you'd start to walk near him, he would just be like, bye, and just, like, leave immediately. We would never let us approach him. He'd disappear for weeks at a time. Then all of a sudden he'd be back for a few days in a row. It was this little dance we had going for about a year. Um, And then here recently, it was probably the beginning of December, I came home from work one day and I pulled in the way and he just oddly sat near the front door, like leave, which was not, he's always run this. And I just know in really bad health. really open them very wide um he definitely was limping and I started noticing he had a swelling on his leg and I got really concerned and he would let me walk up close enough to get good looks at him but then he would like limp away so I reached out to Chris Poole and Lori Piper that um, works with St. Francis and the Humane Society and just started getting some advice. And I brought home a humane trap and had it set up on our carport for a while, had been feeding him. Every single time I would see him, I'd run out the door with food um, because of the raccoons. I couldn't just leave food around all the time. So um It was over two months of me feeding him. And then finally, one day he let me pet his head. And I was like, okay, I think I'm getting closer to where I might be able to like scruff him and just kind of push him into the trap because he, he was way too smart for the trap. Like he would never, ever go in it. I caught multiple raccoons that I had to release. (laughs) Um, And it was just this ordeal like every single night. So I was like, I'm just gonna try to shove him into this like small dog crate that I have. And I had my hands on him and I was about to push him in. And we have this little old man that lives next door that feeds some of the other neighborhood cats. And he came around the corner to ask me what I was about to do with that cat. And of course, Colonel Mustard flipped onto his back and claws and hissing and teeth and then took off running. And I didn't see him for days. And I thought, oh my gosh, like two months down the drain, I'm never going to see this cat again. He was limping worse than he'd ever been. He was actually not even using his front leg at all anymore. Um, So I was pretty devastated, pretty crushed. (laughs) And I... um, I just happened to be, it was two Thursdays, no, two Wednesdays ago, 
Uh, I lucked out because it was the day that we canceled our staff meeting. And thankfully, that worked in my favor because I was walking out my front door. And for the first time in like five days, he was sitting behind my car. And so I ran back in the house and I grabbed a can of food, which is ridiculous because Chris and everybody was telling me like, oh, if you really want to trap a cat, you have to like use like really stinky foods like tuna or get creative and like literally get KFC chicken or something that like they're really going to be enticed by. I like ran in and grabbed like a fancy feast can, like the least exciting food possible, ran back outside. He, I popped the top and he heard it and then he just chased me. He chased me all the way over to the carport. I could barely get the food in the trap before he was eating it ran back in the house at this point i had borrowed from lori a drop trap so a humane trap is you know kind of a long skinny one where they go in and they hit a plate uh that triggers the door to fall behind them and that's how you'd catch them in that with a drop trap it literally looks like a cartoon type trap like something that you would see in an old cartoon it's like a box that has extended up on a, a little pole and you hook um like i used twine but you, you use like a rope or something and as soon as the cat goes under the box you pull it and it falls on them um and thankfully the only piece of advice chris pool really gave me that actually really was beneficial in this situation was he said if you're going to use a drop trap be ready to put something super heavy on it once it drops on the cat because they will have such momentum and so much adrenaline going that they they will shoot like up and pull the whole trap up off the ground and they can usually escape so I pulled it, he was in it, I shot out the door, and I basically laid on top of it while he just did everything imaginable <laughs> to, like, and I'm alone, because, like, my husband had already left for work, and our friend that rents next door was already gone for work, and I was just, like, it's just me and this cat who is freaking out, his poor little feet were bleeding, like, he just was very, very obviously scared and very upset, so then it became this whole, like, now how do I get him out of this trap and into the cage? Uh, because it's it was just, it's just a box with nothing under it. I'm, like, setting lawn furniture on top of him and trash cans and, like, everything that I can find around me to keep him from being able to push it up and, and escape. So that's, that is how I caught him. <laughs> it was not pretty. It was not how it, any of it was planned, but it worked. And this is where my rehab skills came in because how many times we've had to get a very scary bobcat out of like a carrier and into a squeeze cage or into it. And I didn't have nets because like, you know, I didn't think I'd be netting <laughs> a cat that morning. So I had to get really creative and I was using things around the house to make uh, like clip gates to make the hole smaller and um, just using a stick to like poke him to get him to shift like it was I really wish I'd been filming it but I was so in the moment and by myself that I was just like I just my, my, my mind went elsewhere and I got it done and then he went and saw uh, Dr. Justin the next day at the Humane Society and got neutered and um, various things like that, all the vaccines. Um, my goal with this cat was just to trap him, get him neutered, get him medical attention, and then re-release him back onto our property. Um, and then Justin told me that he was FIV positive. So... Um, oh, no. There was no chance on me being able to release him. So our next, what we're currently right in the middle of, is just trying to get him socialized enough um, and, and cage rested enough so that he can go and see, um, you know, a regular vet and get more medical attention because his eyes are still a mess. Um, he's still got a swelling on his leg. Um Dr. Borstein basically said that he fractured his leg at some point, probably got trapped on something or stuck on something um, and pulled it until he fractured his leg. 
but it was sort of like how autumn was when she came into rehab like there was clear break but it was also already healing and there's not really much you can do um you just kind of have to let it heal he's probably always going to limp um he's just definitely not a candidate to go back outside so we don't know whether he'll stay here with us forever or if he will be um, maybe moved on to another foster family. I have a cat myself, Alice. She's the only cat that's ever owned me. And I've had her for 14 years and she is not thrilled <laughs> that this thing has moved <laughs> into our back room. So um, we're dealing with a lot of drama, <laughs> oh, dear. like not wanting to eat and being very needy and things like that. So, um, you know, I definitely, I wouldn't say that trying to rescue feral cats is for the faint of heart <laughs> it's definitely not everything that I expected I I'm definitely not giving advice or or telling people to go do this I looked into a lot of area rescues and people that trap and things like that and what got me the most concerned was you know I know it's kind of an old school way of thinking but FIV used to be a death sentence for cats and if you take them to certain facilities they will almost always euthanize because the cat can't, you know, be back out in, in the world like that. So um, luckily, Justin was on my side with that. And he was like, well, if you're going to try to see if you can get him socialized to, to live indoors and, and stay off the streets, then more power to you. He also was like, he's super mean, so good luck. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like coming from the guy that works on the Bobcats at my job. So, <laughs> so yeah, as of right now, he's still on cage rest. Um, he's a little like just kind of chill, like sad in a way. Like I'm, I'm sure he's feeling pretty distraught that he's not, you know, able to be out and about, but he's in a nice safe covered quiet area of the house. And I did actually this weekend, and Justin said to do about a week cage rest for him and then in four weeks he needs to be seen by another vet um, for like a full workup and I opened his cage door yesterday and it was open all day long and he never bothered to come out he's just content laying on his little fuzzy bed just kind of seems like he's been there done that he's exhausted and needs rest um but i also think he still needs some medical attention so um that's kind of where we're at with him right now <laughs> wow. and his name by the way everyone always thinks that that's you know pretty silly you can thank mark for that um we both grew up watching the movie clue and playing the board game clue and oh, that's where they go yes yes <laughs> so for some reason the very first second that Mark ever saw this cat outside, he called him Colonel Mustard. And I Googled <laughs> Colonel Mustard, and sure enough, this cat looks exactly like him. Like, he's got the big cheeks, and he looks like he has a chin strap of white, which is exactly what that Clue character looked like. So <laughs> it was very fitting, and it just kind of stuck. And now I've got all kinds of silly names for him. He's Spicy Mustard when he's being pretty feral and, and aggressive but he also really likes head scratches and turns into honey mustard at that point but he's <laughs> he's a character and we're really hoping that he'll pull through and turn a corner and that even if he can't you know be part of our family that he'll make a really good silly guy for somebody so <laughs> that's been my, my last two months <laughs> Wow. Well, thank you so much for all of the persistence in getting that cat into the vet and taking care of the things that were continuing to cause him trouble, which would be being intact out there. I lose yes. you every once in a while, so if you um, can stay near your Wi-Fi, that would be really great. But thank you for that. I'm going to hand it off to Deb if she has any questions about Colonel Mustard or the work that you're doing here currently. I know most of the people who are here probably know you because of our um, your live walkabouts that everybody loves, absolutely loves. So thank you for doing those so regularly. Did you have anything, Deb? Um, a couple of things, Brittany. One, <laughs> you and I talk a lot. Um, 
but if you could talk a little bit about Hocus in your squirrel rehab, and also MJ is in the audience, but MJ has laryngitis and bronchitis, so she asked me to pass on to you that you're, she's listening and she loves your patience with Colonel Mustard. Oh, that's very sweet. I hope you feel better. That's terrible. <laughs> um, yeah, so so Hocus. So it's it's pretty interesting. This this back room at our house has kind of been a catch-all for the whole time we've lived here. We didn't really know what to do with it. Um, we didn't have, like, furniture or anything for it. And right off the bat, it became the space where I raised Hocus and Pocus. Um, they were two baby squirrels that had fallen out of a tree. And initially, I was taking care of them, and then just life got too crazy, and she's like, I just can't take care of these squirrels right now, and so I took them on full time, and they were raised in this back room, and then um, after I sadly lost Pocus, I had just a world of issues. That, that poor thing took up at least six months of my life where she was in very intensive care. She ended up passing of that exam um, and I was pretty devastated so I brought home Hocus even though he had been back at the sanctuary um, to be released there Jamie and I were kind of discussing how like the year before we released like 20 squirrels at Big Cat it was a bit crazy and I understand that most of them hang out in Gail's yard and um, the houses behind it see them all the time and I was like do we really want to add another squirrel there I don't know so I got permission to bring him back um, here to our house and then we released him um, out of our backyard I actually used vacation time because I was like well we're right in the middle of a pandemic I can't travel anywhere I'm gonna do a staycation and I'm gonna set the squirrel free and I went out every single day and call for him so I'm sure people thought it was real weird to hear me outside coming hocus into the trees like I'm some new witch that moved into the neighborhood <laughs> so I um, successfully released him here and he hung around for many, many months. Um, it wasn't until, oh gosh, I released him April and I was seeing him daily until through August um, because I remember having a birthday party where we, I, my parents came over and we were swimming and hanging out and we were about to eat lunch on the back porch and I turn around and Hocus is like stuck to the screen behind my dad's head. <laughs> just like hey what, what's the party oh you know so I um I was able to see him pretty much daily always putting out treats and things like that and then he finally went off to do squirrel things and I saw him again in October and then I didn't see him from October till December he randomly showed up uh right around Christmas time um it's funny the girl that our friend that rents our place next door uh, also has to keep peanuts in her car because if she gets home before I do, he will come running up to her vehicle. <laughs> so she always has to be ready. So um, it's it's been very interesting. I mean, we tried not to coddle him too much. We didn't want him destroying our house or destroying the neighbors. Certainly never wanted him to walk up to people he doesn't know, things like that. And luckily he, he doesn't. He definitely keeps his distance. Um, it was a big concern to release him here because this neighborhood does have a lot of, um, like, neighborhood cats. I won't call them all strays or ferals because most of them I point out to each how feeds what cat, like that kind of a thing. And so the colonel was just kind of like our cat that we weren't technically in the beginning, but when I was intact and causing fights with all of these other cats that's when it became a concern to get him but I was very nervous about having Hocus around with so many cats but he's he's one of those like Jamie and I've talked about it a million times it's so weird that even when we're rehabbing them and they let you like eat treat at the moment set them free they full-blown turn into a squirrel um, and they can be very dangerous they can be very destructive so uh, it's again it's not something I recommend to people to do I mean you want to feed them appropriate foods or use a feeder or something like that but um, there are such a thing as nuisance squirrels so 
<laughs> and he rides a fine line sometimes when he comes around, but um, it was it was a very cool experience. He was raised in his house in our yard, and he still comes around from from time to time. Uh, our friend Sarah always says he's like a kid coming home from college. He comes home to eat all your food and then leaves again. <laughs> so. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so Hocus was raised and released here. This this back room actually also raised uh, Summer. So Summer Bobcat, it had her for three weeks um, here. And this was the room where she was set up in very intensive care, um, you know, multiple feedings or force feedings a day just to keep that sweet little ball of fluff alive. Um, but she, she was also in this room. So it's like, this room needs a purpose, but right now it's just been raising animals. <laughs> I think that's its highest and best use. Yes, I agree. I, I wouldn't change it for anything now at this point. Oh, I'm so glad we didn't go buy a bunch of furniture to stick back here. <laughs> like, cause now it's just so. Well, thank you, Brittany. And yes, I can attest that <clears throat> those squirrels are, um, <laughs> There's yeah, a lot of squirrels back there. They're about to be your problem. <laughs> Here, you have a question, and then I'll let you pass it off to Daniel. It went out for a second, Deb. Did you ask me? Yes, yeah, Karen. Second. Okay, okay. I figured you did. Okay. Um, it's it's. I don't know if it's my Wi-Fi or not, but it's going in and out. So I'm, I'm catching most of everything, but Brittany, of course, you know that I know you and I love you. And I think you're an amazing superstar and thank goodness for your back room. First of all, that's amazing <laughs> yeah. that you, right. That you have yeah. that room there uh, much needed. And I was just thinking about TikTok when you were saying about you putting the lawn furniture on the, um, on the trap and also with Hocus great those would make some great tiktoks Brittany. that would be amazingly <laughs> funny right would that be the i know i but, wish i understood tiktok a little bit more because i definitely agree our funny farm around here would probably be a really good <laughs> subject <okay>. matter <laughs> you guys would be so entertaining you'd have lots of followers i can tell you that but when you when you started posting about colonel mustard it just you know struck this interest in me because I've been learning about ferals and uh, the last year I always did the big cats of course and was worked for rescues but ferals I just I never could understand ferals and I guess it made me sad so I never really I never really dealt you know dove into it or really wanted to know about them because they make me sad the poor things and I even wrote that on your post mm -hmm. but um I didn't realize it. Jen had told me a long time ago that there are a lot of neighborhood cats and that the people feed them. That is amazing to me. In New Jersey, that doesn't happen. I don't know if it's just because of um, the weather, perhaps. I'm not really sure. But it is, it's extremely interesting. So I wanted to thank you for keeping us updated because um, we're all following, wondering what's going to happen with this cat. Did your neighbors... So I had wondered, did your neighbors actually know of him before or he just showed up for you one day how, how did that work yeah no that's a great question so when we first moved in um at the little old man i mentioned earlier that screwed up my first catch <laughs> um he feeds one specific female cat every single day and there was a, a day that Mark went over to kind of ask him if he knew where Colonel Mustard might have come from or if he does have an owner, like maybe on a couple streets over or something like that. And he kind of went on a rampage about how, I don't know, that old Tomcat's always around and it's always trying to steal food. And he basically, this, this man chases him away and yells at him and throws stuff at him and like doesn't want him affecting his cat that he takes care of. And so we got the impression that he's been around for a few years, that he was definitely here before we got here, but nobody really knows where he came from. I'm sort of wondering if potentially the owners of this house prior to us moving in might have had him and then let him go. I mean, he he's very unique looking. So for any of you guys that have seen a, a photo of him, he looks like a designer cat. He's He looks very similar to like a British um, short hair. People pay thousands of dollars for those cats. 
Um, I'm kind of wondering if he wasn't originally a pet at one point and then they didn't neuter him clearly and he got aggressive and, um, you know, probably wanted to roam, most likely maybe escaped out of the house and has just been out and about. Justin thinks he's about five years old, so he's much younger than I would have ever guessed, but, you know, the streets are hard. They do age you. So um, it's, it's hard to say. I fully believe at one point in time he was probably somebody's pet that was either abandoned or he escaped and they just never saw him again and then they moved or something like that. Um, but no, I've, I've asked everybody that I see, I will like pull up a picture of him on my phone and be like, do you know this cat? <laughs> because I certainly don't want to steal somebody's cat, but also at the same time, no one was taking care of him. Like, clearly he has a broken leg. He's got some kind of eye infection type thing going on. Clearly he now has a major immune um, disorder that, you know, right. is not something to be ignored. So clearly even if he was being fed or something by somebody, they're not, they weren't doing what they needed to be doing. So now he's mine. <laughs> like, essentially, like, he's now microchipped to me and everything because I... Just want to make sure that, you know, if he ever slipped out a door, which at this point he won't even leave the cage on his own. Like, he's just very content sleeping all day long. Um, he is eating and drinking, and he is using a litter box, thank, thank the Lord. So there are those things working in his favor, but you can tell he just still doesn't feel well. So, yeah. Um, but at this point, I, I've kind of stopped asking people about him because it's been a year and nobody has a clue where he came from. It's funny because all of a sudden I, I have two ferals and it's freezing here. It's only like 12 degrees right now. And there's about five inches on the ground. And I have a whole enclosure out there for them, which they come in and out of. But all of a sudden, a big, giant black cat that looked like Jinx re just showed up one night. So I feel like they find you. They yes. know where there's food. So it's no better example as with Colonel Mustard, they find you. Definitely. So thank you, thank you, thank you. I'll be following. If there's anything I can help you with, you let me know. I would help with anything with this guy because I really want to see him uh, succeed. So thank you, and I'll pass it along to Daniel. Thank you. Well, hi, Brittany, again. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, thank you for taking on the colonel. And I'm hoping you've hidden any clue instruments from him so he's not using a candlestick. Correct. Uh, <laughs> Although I really do want to find some really creative cat toys that would be like <laughs> things from that game. That would be really fun. <laughs> um, as I said, thank you very much for taking care of him. And I know, like, feral cats are not easy. Um, I have a question that's actually not about Colonel Mustard. Okay. Um, yeah. I know that you say that some cats at the sanctuary choose you. And I know you, you talked about Cyrus and how he chose you before I'm live. But how, how did you first know that Smalls and Cyrus said, okay, you're mine? Definitely. Um, usually it's it, with both of those cats, when they first came in, they hid all the time. They were super picky eaters. Cyrus was just nonstop hissing at everybody. Um, and I just, I, I really identify with the cats that feel like not like they're rescued you know they should they should be feeling like happy and content and loved and when they come in and they act like that for you know months because both both cases it was you know right off the bat they were just really reserved would hide away um again not eating regularly things like that and so I would start taking them spice bags or sickles or things like that and all of a sudden I'd be the only person they would be responsive to for a while. So with Smalls, she really hates change. If you move that cat, she literally chews off her back foot and she will stop eating. And so that poor thing, when we put her on funcation, which is supposed to be fun, she was miserable both times. I was the only person she would come over to to eat food. So I don't know why there's that connection, but for some reason, both of them have been responsive in that way. Um, 
I have a video actually of the moment that Cyrus chose to like me because <laughs> he went from growling and grumbly and hissing and to all of a sudden making that really cute trilling noise and then showing me his butt. So that's another really funny thing that not every keeper out there gets to experience with every single cat is supposedly when they turn and show you their little rear end it's because they trust you and they're they're marking you they're claiming you um and they feel safe enough to turn their back on you so um that was another clear sign where most people would be like wow i didn't i've never heard him make that sound before i mean now thankfully he's they've both been there long enough where they're adjusted to the routines and they do feel safe and um, you know, they, they've bonded with not just me. I mean, luckily, because that's a lot of pressure, by the way. When you have a cat that only wants to be responsive to you, um, like I'm in that boat with Gilligan right now. Gilligan will eat for me and hardly anyone else. And so that's a lot of pressure when it's like, oh, I have two days off in a row. Is he going to be okay? You know, like what if I'm not there to like, you know, give them something? So it's a huge relief when they do turn that corner with other people. But it was, I just put in the time. Basically, if I see that a cat needs a friend because they are just not responsive to anyone, I just never gave up. And, um, you know, now if we move smalls, I will literally go hang out with her for a couple of hours and show her that it's okay. And I bring all of her favorite stuff and then she snaps out of it and she's like, oh, okay, everything's fine. Um, but not, not many people can do that there with all the cats everybody out there has i would say has at least one cat that has chosen them um you know there are people that ariel will come to that she won't come to anybody else so um it's a it's an important role as a keeper out there is to find those bonds and make sure that their cats are well taken care of because they definitely do choose you and they make it pretty obvious because they will do things for only you um, and it may be months or years or never that they do that with other people. So it's a lot of pressure, but it's also very special. <laughs> yeah, uh, I always say that Smalls has the most famous butt on VCR property. <laughs> she does. <laughs> and I don't care how your day is going. As soon as you hear that Cyrus trill, it just melts you and mm -hmm. everything just goes away. <laughs> Thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks, Daniel. Bella, you're next. Hi, Brittany. Um, my question's kind of a two-parter about when you were rescuing and saving Colonel Mustard, the adrenaline compared to like when you're going out to find a bobcat and all, is it the same comparison or was there more stress with Colonel Mustard than there is with getting a bobcat in a cage? Um, I, to be totally honest, it was, it was about the same for me, but I did feel extra pressure in the sense that like I was completely alone. Um, you know, usually when we go out after a bobcat, we're a team and there's multiple people and you're all helping each other and you can all, you know, when I dropped that trap on him, I was alone and I was like, now what, <laughs> now how do I get this cat back out of here? Um, and I just didn't want to fail him because I, I knew clearly he needs medical attention, which it's the same with the bobcats. I mean, we've never just gone out to rescue a healthy bobcat. There's always a lot of pressure, you know, knowing that it could be, you know, the, a wasting disease or they could be injured or something's broken or, you know, any of that kind of stuff. So it, it's, a, it was definitely the same kind of adrenaline it was just weirdly more pressure because I was by myself, basically. Well, thank you for rescuing him and taking care of him. And Mary, you're up. Hi there, Brittany. Thank you so much for rescuing that sweet little boy. Um, <laughs> my family has a tendency to do the same thing. Uh, I had a sister that rescued a lot of ferals, and my niece has been rescuing ferals. So, uh, and that's in Ohio, so that's kind of grim. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Pardon me. Um, I was going to ask you about your T-shirt and any of the designs that you're coming up with now. Have you thought about going to um, the rehab cats instead of just? permanent residence 
Yes, definitely. Um, usually, though, that is definitely Jamie's department. <laughs> um, I'm sure she wouldn't mind if uh, we had another designer that wanted to create something. I know she's been, her wheels have been spinning, but you know how artists are. Like, you can't just, like, you have to be inspired. The moment has to hit you. You have to have the time to create. And um, I know she's got things swirling around in her mind for summer, for sure. Um, traditionally, when there's been time, because that's the other biggest issue at this point, is the, the time it takes for her to be able to sit down and create something when, you know, the sanctuary's needs are just constantly changing. Um, but she used to always make one design per rehab cat that we would sell usually right around the time they were released. Um, so <laughs> with that being said, we've had such a strange year of Bobcats. Um, obviously, probably one of the scariest and saddest things we've all gone through was the Khaleesi virus that took the lives of the three kittens, and we had to fight to keep Kahira. <laughs> and, you know, summer is such an oddity. And and forever evolving situation as well so it's it's probably been hard to get inspired um to sell things for cats where we're still just trying to figure out if they can ever go free um of course that is always the, the number one goal and it, it crushes our souls when we can't do that and it's like the very last resort <laughs> so we're gonna try everything we can to see how it goes but, um, but yes, yeah, so we, we have quite a few designs for Bobcats, but she tends to keep it pretty general, unless, of course, it's, like, gonna be for a release. Um, but, yeah, I've, I've kind of recently gave her an updated list of, like, these are the cats that would be really cool if you want to make something. <laughs> so, but um, I usually don't tell my artists what to create because again that can that can take the fun out of it and they aren't being paid for it they're you know they are just donating their time and their talent so I give them a suggestive list where I'm like these cats don't have a design or this cat you know needs something more current but I don't force them to create anything so they've all they're all allowed to do whatever they want um and I do always suggest it so the other downfall too is a lot of our artists get inspired by the photographs that they see on Facebook and Instagram and we don't do a lot of photographing of the rehab cats because they are out in rehab and we don't spend a lot of time out there doing that and if Jamie does collect photos it's not always for sharing it's for you know archiving so that you know if they are released then we've got spot patterns and things like that so um but yes I, they they are all aware they can make something <laughs> so, fingers crossed <laughs> well on the picture photographs christine does about 30 photographs a day on the true room. Yeah, true. I know it's a little funky with it being Explore and, you know, anytime you share things from Explore, you've got to credit Explore and things like that. And they're not as high quality also, so that's, but, that can be a factor, yeah. I have to say, Miss Summer is the most photogenic of everybody. <laughs> she is. <laughs> and I think she's the most well-loved. <laughs> yeah, yeah. She's, she's something else, that's for sure. Well, thank you so much. Of course. Key. I think he is next. Yep. Hi, everybody. Um, hi, Brittany. I just, um, I just want to thank you for, you know, rescuing Colonel Mustard. He looks like he is a cat with full personality. <laughs> um, he, he's really a handsome guy. I mean, uh, you know, I don't know how much, um, this is going to cost you, but maybe you should, um, you know, put out a feeler for donations because I definitely would try to help you out. I mean, you know, I know it's expensive. It's going to be expensive for him. Um, yeah, you know, my I mom's been begging me to do a GoFundMe, and I was like, well, we're just, you know, luckily because Jamie um, got involved and sent me to Justin at the Humane Society, you know, it was it was pretty manageable. 
but yes, I, I agree. Ongoing is going to be pretty rough. And my mom's like, you should not be spending your money on this cat. And I'm like, but what, you know, like that's who I am as a person. I'm going to make sure he gets everything that he needs. But, um, I'm just going to cross that bridge when we get there. Cause right now, you know, I've, I've scheduled to have a home visit vet come because I just don't think he's going to do well traveling. And we've got one in our area that will literally pull up in the driveway and they're mobile, uh, vet mobile. So we're going to go that route with him, um, hopefully sooner than later. But I was told to give him a couple of weeks of just resting. So yeah, I he's- appreciate that. Yeah, I don't know. But, you know, you might not want to, you know, go to the GoFundMe, but, you know, a lot of people want to help. And when they see other people helping, sometimes they can't help. But, um, you know, you'd be doing it for the cat, you know, and um, it, it's a great thing that you're doing. I mean, you you have a big heart and it comes across all the time with everything that you do whether it's the cats, whether it's the squirrels or the ducks or the rabbits, you really do have a big heart. And when you are doing a walkabout and you're, you know, primarily repeating a lot of stuff, but you are getting new ears every time. So even though we know what you're talking about, most of us who follow you, um, that you're always going to grab another new listener or someone that's going to follow you. So don't ever feel like you're, you're going over the same thing over and over again because you do such a great job at Big Cat and we can see how much you love them and how much they make you smile. So thank you, Brittany. And, and thank you for all your beautiful photos. They, those photos help me to keep posting to try to keep people aware of what's going on. So thank you again. You're, you're a really nice person. Well, thank you. That's very, very sweet. I, I appreciate hearing that. <laughs> Looks like Lisa's next. Hi, Brittany. It's so nice to finally talk to you. Uh, hi, Lisa. <laughs> Thanks for joining. <laughs> I'm good. <laughs> good. Um, I have to say, you are actually what first got me roped into Big Cat Rescue. Um, I was home a couple, three years ago um, with injuries that I sustained on my job and a random video popped up with a live from you and boom, I was hooked. <laughs> and I've I've been hooked on BCR. I did research and everything in, into them to make sure they were good peoples and y'all are good peoples. And um, I have to say, I... I love your fierce heart for cats and all animals, but you also have a tender heart that is very touching and very relatable. And um, it speaks to, I think, all of us who, who care about all these animals. And thank you for that. Uh, my question, Relating to ferals, um, I could ask you a million questions, but relating to ferals, um, I've had cats all my life. Right now, I have two sister cats, Vivian and Evelyn, uh, named after my grandmother and her younger sister, and they were little itty bitty one pound and less than one pound kittens that we found under the truck lift at the Trader Joe's I was working at as an artist and I rescued them. It's the first time I've ever had two cats together um, and they started out like yin and yang, always together. 
but I've noticed when feral cats or neighborhood cats, I live, I should say, in a subdivision in a suburb of Chicago where the houses are like maybe four or five houses that are connected by one wall and an end unit with the common area and the playground behind me. So I have more open space than some of the homes. So I will see a lot of cats come around. Some have collars, some don't. I don't know how many of them are ferals or how many are just neighborhood cats that people let out, which I wish they wouldn't because Mm -hmm. it's not safe for them. Um, the problem I have is I want to take care of these cats and I used to take care of feral cats in the past, but my two girls go absolutely crazy. They, I've, I've asked the vets about this and they call it record. Oh, what is it? Recognition aggression where if they see or hear these cats outside of my house or right up by the door, they go crazy and then they attack each other. My girls attack each other and it's brutal. And so I don't feel like I can help any of these feral cats outside my home because it's endangering my own cats inside the home even without that cat being inside the house they will attack each other brutally and it's just awful have you ever dealt with anything like this or heard of something like this and have any advice because i want to help these cats but it's endangering my own girls and I can't have that and it breaks my heart definitely Uh, yeah I mean that that's been one of the biggest concerns with us with with my cat Alice because um generally she she's very very posh she honestly could care less when there's cats outside she just you know but she also has never had another cat inside so we all know that even you know domesticated cats are pretty solitary like they don't want to be messed with they don't want to compete for anything or share or any any of that kind of stuff um and they'll have those moments i'm sure it's all about the pheromones um but what i would probably do and i looked into it here in in this area was there are so many organizations out there that keep track of cat colonies Um, so it's like literally something that Chris Poole does here in this area where he goes and he feeds, you know, and checks the health of a lot of these cats. And so there are plenty of nonprofits and organizations out there. Like we have like four or five here in St. Pete because I reached out to them to get advice on, well, what do I even do if I can catch this cat? And they hadn't, he was never in their, uh, database because a lot of these organizations will, take photos and they know how many cats are in colonies and they trap them they make sure that they are neutered or spayed and then they re-release them things like that so you might just have to reach out to some of the local groups and explain like you see a bunch of them and you want to make sure they're taken care of but um and just do your research though you know certain certain groups aren't created equal so you want to make sure that they their mission is to do exactly that make sure that they're fed and that their their health status is okay um not something that's going to trap them and euthanize them that type of thing so but yeah i would say for the (laughs) safety of your of your own you know cats and and keeping them in in good condition you probably want to hand that off to somebody who is out there doing that regularly Um, and there's plenty of them out there. You just have to really search for it and do the research on, um, groups that deal with community, like cat colonies. One of the best groups, uh, that I know of is a little, a little bit of a ways from where I live and who helped me in getting my girls uh, spayed and um, microchipped and all of that but do you have any suggestions on 
what to do if a cat continually comes to your door and how to make it leave to not endanger your cats without hurting the outside cat. Right. Mm, That's tricky because like I said, I'm a total fish out of water in this whole situation. This is my first like dealing with a, a feral situation and Uh, again my cat could care less inside of course now that he's inside she's like doing the dramatic like I don't want to eat right now kind of a thing um but I I mean I would probably still reach out to because a lot of those organizations will have people scattered all over um so that you know if somebody can't make it to check on a colony that somebody that they know that lives nearby can pop over, you may have to relocate. It could be a a cat that's not spayed or neutered and it's sensing the pheromones of your females. Um, Obviously, if you don't want it to stick around, I would stop feeding if you're feeding cats outside. Um, (laughs) But I would definitely turn it over to like a local group. I was just going to interrupt just because I, this is Karen, but if you go on Facebook and you look for um, feeders, you'll be able to tell those those cats might already be in a colony that are being fed. So there's a lot of TNR groups. So you can look up TNR on Facebook or you can look up cat feeders, feral cat feeders, and you'll be able to know if those cats are already involved in a current colony, which they probably are if they look like they're in good condition. Mm-hmm. And they may be able to come um, help you so that they're not in front of your house all the time. So I would try on Facebook, you know, in your local area. Just make sure you put in your area. And they'll come up. They'll come up right, you know, just how if you search Big Cat Rescue, you can search feral cats. I would try that. Thanks, ladies. And thanks, Brittany. You're just, you're just a doll. Thank you. Ooh, we love thanks. you. Thank you, Lisa. <laughs> And let's head it on to Cassie. Hi, guys. Um, I think I've shared this story written with you before, but I just wanted to share a quick feral story of my own. I know we're running short on time, so I'll be I'll be quick. Um, back in, like, 2005, the guy I was dating at the time was redoing a business um, out in Wesleyan, the, the college, and there was a family of cats living underneath one of the buildings. And they were there for some time, and, and by the time the... Um, construction wrapped it up there was only a mom and one kitten left they were kind of close to a main road and i i'd like to think they all got adopted but not really sure that happened um and there was one left and so i went to my grandma's house and i got to have a heart trap and i set it out there and i grabbed the cat and he (laughs) he was spicy (laughs) um i brought him to the pet store i was working at and one of the girls there had been doing you know rescues for years I just wanted to deworm him and, you know, do a once over on him. He was about six weeks old and she wouldn't touch him because he was that crazy. And I'm like, oh, Jesus, she won't go after him. What am I going to do with this cat? Oh. I brought him home and he's lived with me for many, many years. Um, but one really cool thing that, you know, I learned from you guys is that whole retractable scratcher piece. So Wesley has never been a fan of me. Um, he doesn't want to be in the the same room he doesn't want to make eye contact he doesn't want to be pet um he did like really uh bond with one of my cats so at least he had a you know he had a friend um i just was not that friend <laughs> and um, he started to get matted you know he wasn't grooming well he's probably about 15 now but this is maybe he's about 13 14 that started and uh i saw you guys using the retractable scratcher so i actually have one of them and so i started using it with him and it worked I was able to get the mats off of him. I was able to press my luck a little bit. I was able to pet him. And we are now friends. Um, we're, we are only friends in one spot right next to the kitchen. I can't touch him anywhere else. He is, I, I think he might be a little special. But he, um, like, I can, I can completely pet him now. He purrs like crazy. He's a drooler, which is a little weird, but adorable. Um, yeah, I, can get you know totally just lay on the cat practically in this one spot and you know it it really 
as many things as I tried over the years, um, nothing had worked, but that scratcher did. So super grateful to have seen you guys do that. It gave me a great idea. And now we are, we're, we're kind of buds. I'll, I'll push my luck and say we're friends. Um, but just appreciate you guys sharing all the, the tips and tricks that you guys do with cats. Um, you just never know when one random thing is, you know, going to help somebody out that's watching. So appreciate Absolutely. that. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. I, I love that because um, that's definitely been the only way that I've been able to work up to petting him um, in general because he... I had a scratcher that I only used on Tiger Lily and I had retired it and I brought it home and it's not even at the sanctuary. And then it dawned on me. I was like, Oh, maybe like while he's eating, I can try to, uh, just see if he'll tolerate it. And he instantly closes his eyes and he stands up and like pushes harder against it. And it was all about it. And now I can actually use my fingers to pet his, his head but with the rest of him I mean you know he gets a little sassy if you if you put it near his tail but he's tolerating <laughs> that too so I have hopes that the scratcher will help us turn a corner too but I am a little nervous that he's going to be that forever independent like doesn't really want to be near you because he you know he had the opportunity to be near us this weekend and has chosen to stay on the other side of the room. So, um, but I love that story because that does, it does give some hope. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we went, what, 13 years without being friends and we lived in the same home for all this time. So trust me, have some patience. It might, it might come Definitely. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and you're up next. Hi everyone. Hi, Brittany. Um, I always say that it was Pharaoh that brought me to Big Cats. Uh, he just randomly appeared on an internet search feed, and I'm sure it had nothing actually to do with Big Cat Rescue. Um, but he brought me, and Brittany, you're a big reason of why I have stayed and uh, bonded without having to touch the cats. I have feel the bond to you. I feel the bond to the cats, uh, and you're the reason I sponsor so many at this point. And I've said to you before, I think on Instagram, uh, that you're who I consider to be a real life Disney princess. <laughs> <laughs> and since Walt would be a distant cousin, I feel that I am qualified to designate you a real life Disney princess. Um, but my boy in the photo here, hopefully he will give you some hope as well. So this is my Aslan in my photo. And the rescue who adopted him thought he was going to have to be released only as a barn cat. And they realized pretty quickly he's a big love. Mm -hmm. But despite how much of a big love he is, he will sometimes slap at me and he slaps hard. Uh, <laughs> I've had him almost a year and a half and he's only just getting to the point where I can give him kisses. But he may never be a cat that will be one that you can pick up and carry around the house or be a lap cat and cat and snuggle like that but uh it's been a year and a half almost before i could give him kisses so uh take your time <laughs> and i'm sure i'm sure you're totally in love with the colonel right now so oh my uh, gosh i can sit and stare <laughs> at him that's all i do like me I, too <laughs> I, I want, i've always wanted a gray kitty so i'm just like oh colonel <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, well you know when i spent over two months coming home every single day like stalking this cat like looking out every window walking the whole property like as soon as i'd see him i'd go running outside whether i was wearing shoes or in my pajamas or whatever like did this for so long and then the reality of him finally like I caught him and he's currently in a room in my house I just like look at him and then I cry <laughs> because I'm like I can't believe that I got him and then of course right now tonight is supposed to be the coldest that Florida has seen in yeah. years um so like risk of like pipes freezing and things like that and I just keep thinking about the fact that like he could be I mean because I can tell he still feels a little icky and to have to have been outside in this and now he's in a heated room on a cozy bed like it really sends me over the top like emotionally <laughs> like even if you never let me like fully pet you fine like I'm just glad that he's like safe right now so yes I, I'm like that even with the wild animals here in New Hampshire I'm like oh the poor deer it's so cold <laughs> um, and I had at one point showed you a picture on Instagram of a little fox 
family that grew up in my barn and one little gray fox sniffing on a dandelion because I said that's a Britney picture mm-hmm. with a little <laughs> fox and the dandelion uh but even just them they were fairly friendly with me but trying to keep that space and keep them aware that humans are not friends to fox yeah uh and then when they grew up a few months later left Oh, my heart was broken. But but anyways, thank you so much for all that you do. You're incredible. I love your lives, but never feel pressured if you're not feeling well or it's cold or icky out to give us a live. Uh, We will live. And I will pass it to Chad. And I'm so happy I spoke before Chad because I just know that Chad is going to make me cry. (laughs) Because he's a big mush like me as well. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, hey, 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 Deb, um, Karen, uh, Carol, uh, I just want to uh, take a moment uh, out of Brittany's busy day to say thank you for all your lives, uh, your countless hours that you give us do not go unnoticed. And I just want to tell you, if your foot's hurting, or if you're sick and you're not feeling well and your sinuses are just absolutely going bonkers, don't worry about giving us a live. We'll all live. And the I other know. day, the other day that you were in the golf cart and the pouring down rain, just give us a drive through and give us a live. Uh, you know, uh, me and my wife, thank you for all your service. And Mark, we love you guys. We love Big Cat Rescue. We've been supporters for three years now and uh, I'm going to be a voice for the cats until my life passes away and I'll never ever ever turn my back on Big Cat Rescue and I love you guys Carol Baskin I love you I pray for you guys daily I pray for the staff and the keepers daily I just love everything y'all do and thank you so much for your service Brittany I love you thank Thank you you so much Chad I knew he was going to make me tear up again. <laughs> Diana, it's your turn. Do you have a question or comment? Be sure to unmic yourself. Am I here? Hello. There, there you are. <laughs> I just want to say thank you. You ladies, all the, everybody at uh, BCR is just, to me, amazing. I think you do miracles constantly. And I'm with Chad. I'm praying for you guys all the time. And uh, I'm going to get emotional, so ignore me. But uh, <laughs> Brittany, what you do, you know, <laughs> Colonel Mustard, when I saw him the first time, I just said, Colonel Mustard is perfect. <laughs> he just <laughs> looks like Colonel Mustard. <laughs> uh, and Carol, Deb, um, all, Karen, all of you are just, to me, amazing people. So thank you. God bless you and keep you all safe and sound always. And I'm with you as often and as every day when I can be. So take care. And thank you for letting me speak. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you, Diana. That's very, very kind of you. <laughs> We're glad you're here. <laughs> okay, I'm going to turn it over to Don. Hi, Brittany. Hi, everyone. Um, Once again, how can I um, say what everybody else on this panel has said tonight? Um, Brittany, um, you you rock, really. (laughs) Um, We look so forward to your lives. Um, The stories that you have come and put on, um, it just literally like brightens us every day um i mean really um you are amazing you're awesome and again i'm gonna say like everybody else said if you don't feel good absolutely we will live (laughs) until the next day Um, yeah but well um, i will i will say a lot of times when i am you know if my foot issue is happening or you know but lovely sinuses during rainy season or cold season it does make me feel better to see you guys just as much as you enjoy 
um, you know, us doing the live. So it's, it's part of my routine and it upsets me when I feel like I can't do part of that routine. Um, so I, I get through it because I, I want to for you guys as much as I want to for me. So <laughs> thank That's you guys. Awesome. <laughs> That's awesome, Brittany. And again, um, um, best of luck with uh, this Colonel Mustard because uh, I, I have a feeling he's just going to melt in your hand eventually. <laughs> I um, <hope> so. <laughs> you know, and, and with your other cat, Alice, um, it's going to take time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, she was used to being the queen and now there's somebody else there going and she's like um mom what are you doing <laughs> mm -hmm. well i i told mark how it's kind of unreal i think she really knows the intention of this animal might be different because yes. when the squirrels were here when the bunnies were here when summer the rehab bobcat was here she could have cared less she never yes. paid any attention and now all of a sudden i think she's like Ooh, wait, this one might stay forever. <laughs> and right. So that's where the change has taken place, I think, where that and obviously he was an unneutered un male, um, but he's using a litter box and he's neutered now. So I'm hoping that that's not part of it. But uh, I think she she does. She feels that the intention of this particular animal is different than what she has tolerated before. <laughs> yes. And the bottom line is, is everything just takes time. Yeah. So. I thank you for allowing me to speak. Um, everybody up here is just once again telling you how awesome you are. <laughs> and I am another person just to tell you, Brittany, you rock. And we love you so much. And we're here for the cats. Mm. Thank you so much for everything you do. Thank you, Dawn. Hey, Brittany, it's Susan. Um, I just... Um, first want to echo what everybody has said that you're an awesome person not just for what you do for the cats but everything you take home um, my uh, cat who passed last year had lots of medical problems but was also um, probably semi-feral so I never got to pet her unless she was sedated that is mm -hmm. um, and um, from BCR, I, I thought, well, I'll give it a go. And I tried to use like a paper bag and put some uh, catnip in it and it worked for her. So there may be many more things you can apply from BCR to Colonel Mustard, mm -hmm. um, if you think on it, because you know all the tricks and you know how much patience it took to get Cyrus and um, Mrs. Smalls to, yeah, to reach out to you so indeed not just the patients but all your experience can be applied and i was wondering if carol would like to add some tips to that you would be surprised how little i know about getting cats to get along <laughs> i i agree though i this whole adventure could have never I never would have had the knowledge and the tools to do what I've done thus far and what I hope to do with him if it hadn't been for for everything you've learned at Big Cat I mean I'm approaching seven years there now and um, just every possible level um, you know you you learn something new every single day um, you know, being a meds keeper is obviously coming in very handy. He had several days of antibiotics, and I'm like, how is this going to work? And literally grabbed my own barbecue tongs and <laughs> feeding him <laughs> his pills. You know, like, it's just this whole thing where I'm like, thank the Lord that Big Cat has such a in-depth, lucrative training program that has just evolved over the years. And then to be a rehabber as well, I mean you guys would laugh so hard because the way I rigged up his, his, um, cage rest situation is exactly mm -hmm. what you see in rehab. It's what we raised Flint and I basically connected oh, wow. two dog cages together and have food and, you know, water on one side and litter on the other. And I can separate if I need to. Of course, he's really not been aggressive. He'd rather just you stay away from him, but that is his current setup. 
Um, and you know, I've learned all those tips and tricks from being out there. So, um, it definitely is being applied in real life now, <laughs> which is such a blessing. Yeah. So, yeah. And just you. to add one more for you, um, I couldn't pet my latest cat, but she would choose to stay in the room with me, even though she was on the other side of the room. Mm -hmm. And she to chose to walk up to me, even though she kept um, um, five foot distance. And I, I've always loved her. And and um, um, I just wanted to say, uh, every cat has its personality, and even if you can never. If they will never be as close to you as you want them to be, uh, you know more than anybody else that you can love them and be loved even from a distance. Because that's what I learned from you oh, with that's... Lily and all the others. That's great. Thank you, Susan. So with that, I think I'll pass on to Barbara. Thank you so much. Well, hello there, uh, Brittany and Deb and Carol and Karen and everybody. Um, yeah, first of all, when you were talking about when you found Colonel Mustard and I saw the picture, the first thing I thought of was it's got to be a British short hair mm -hmm. and that had to be somebody's pet. So, yeah. and, you know, which if it was somebody's pet, he's really not a true pharaoh. You know, it's a stray, right. which goes in your, you know, uh, makes your life easier because, because, yeah, you know, like you say, he's just laying in the house. If he was a true feral, he'd be bouncing off the walls and he right. would be all kind of noise. But, and, you know, like up here in Minnesota, we don't put cats down for like FIV anymore. We used to do it a few years ago. Mm -hmm. But I know a woman who has six cats and I think four of them have FIV. And people will, you know, like she'll have friends who will say, oh, all your cats have to have it. And she makes bets with them. She says, we'll take them all to the vet. We'll have them all tested. If they all have FIV, I'll pay for it. If they don't, you pay for it. And she's yeah. never had to pay for an FIV test. Wow, yeah. Because, they've never, because it's, you know, it's passed through, um, you know, biting and, and, you know, deep wounds. Mm -hmm. So if they never, you know, if your two never fight, there's there's really no problem of, you know, and I think what your 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 Alice is a is a is a torty, which you know you yeah, have all she, that yeah all that torty too. Yes, yeah, yeah, she's <laughs> very sassy. Um, yeah. yeah, and she you know she while he's been on cage rest, I've been letting her if she wanted to walk out into that room just to get used to the sights and and scents. And of course, she hisses at him, and he just sits there and looks at her. Um, but, uh, you know, I don't see them sharing space for probably a very long time, if ever, because I just don't know how his personality is going to be. I'm hoping he just wants to be a lazy couch kitty. But at this point, you know, he's I just know that he's still not feeling very well. So I don't think I'm ever going to see his true personality until we've gotten to the bottom of all of his ailments. Um, so I'm really looking forward to getting that ball rolling so we can see how he does when he's you know all fixed up so oh, yeah and and the fiv you know that a lot of people you know you just feed them good food and you keep them inside and you just keep them healthy is mm -hmm. you know that's about all you can do with that but yeah yeah definitely. yeah yeah we've had a lot go through our shelter with fiv and it's the feline leukemia that's the killer you don't want i that know and i uh what a blessing to hear that he was negative yeah. on that so yeah that, that was that was a big deal, yeah, for sure. But no, you know, we always tell the people when they um, bring cats home and they, you know, we say, you know, we ask them, well, was there any blood? And they say no. We said, well, you won. Yeah. Because if there's <laughs> no blood, you're winning. Yes. So. <laughs> and like those, <laughs> those two cats in that pit, I just adopted them about um, three weeks ago. They were barn cats. And they are Cricket and Cyrus. Oh, and Cyrus only has one ear, so I don't know. I know, but and they are a major bonded pair. But but they're you know they were all caught. They were all there's video of the capture, and they all those cats were netted. None of them were pick upable. They were all you know flying around off the rafters of the barn, and now they're a little love bug. So you know, just hang in there. <laughs> you Thank know. you. I appreciate the encouragement. <laughs> Yep, bye-bye. Bye, thank you.
I just want to say one more thing. I know we're all finished, but doesn't Colonel Mustard remind you of Deuteronomy? Is that his name on um, Cats? This is cat yes, cat. yes, yes, Deuteronomy, yes. <laughs> right? Isn't he so that cat that's just like seems like he's going to rule your house at some point. Like, yes. I, I actually just told Mark about that because um, we were gifted um, back in November two tickets to go see Cats here in Tampa. And I had seen it when I was a teenager uh, in New York City, and it was incredible. And then Mark has never actually been to a Broadway play, so that was his very first one. And I was like, get ready to cry because, like, you know, Stray Cats and, like, all those stuff. And then literally, like, I think it was two days later that Colonel Mustard was sitting on my porch very visibly in need of medical attention. And I was like, oh, no, <laughs> we opened something with the universe. <laughs> See, I, I knew that. I did. Yep. I knew that. <laughs> yep. <laughs> well, I want to thank everybody for joining this evening and sharing their their stories and their positive uh, feedback to Brittany. Um, if everybody on the stage would open your mics and thank Brittany for spending her hour and a half with us tonight. <laughs> thank you, Brittany. Thank you, Brittany. Thank you, Brittany. Thank you, Brittany. Brittany. You're beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you, Brittany. Love, love, love. Never stop. And Brittany, just to just to let you know, if you want to do a GoFundMe uh, thing, I will be happy to, um, you know, put in for that. Absolutely. Yeah, I will contribute too. Oh, thank you guys so much. With you. Oh, you guys are too much. Uh, thank you very much. I really, I just appreciate, honestly, all the, the verbal support just because I tend to feel kind of lost and alone in this whole whole endeavor. And you guys always find a way to just like totally humble me. And... You are not alone. Absolutely <laughs> not alone. Well, thank you guys. Carol, did you have anything before we before we talk about next week? I did not. Well, next week, everybody that's pretty much here knows that Carol always likes to try something new, right? Uh-oh. <laughs> yeah. Oh, boy. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Oh, so, so next week, um, we will be in a Twitter space, and we our guest will be will meet us there, and our guest is a surprise, and so you guys are going to have to wait and find out. Deb! <laughs> But it will be a Twitter space, and if you don't know how to get into a Twitter space, I will be more than happy to help you. So if you want to message me or click on my little flower and you can find out how you can get a hold of me, um, I will be happy to help you walk into that space. It is not hard. It's very, very similar to Clubhouse. Um, The reason, one of the reasons we're going to do it there is Carol has been in Twitter space a lot recently, and... um, we want to just kind of see what kind of audience we have there. So um, next week we will meet at the same time, six o'clock on Saturday, and uh, but it will be in the Twitter space instead. And I will remind you throughout the week on Facebook. So, um, Dad, will you? I'm sorry to interrupt you. Do you have like a in uh, invitation thing for that? So there, that... I I I'll post. There will be. <laughs> You can create a link that says this is where it's going to be, and it'll actually set a reminder for you so that when it's time, you'll be able to get in. That's what I was asking. Okay, thank you. So I'm, I'm still kind of new at this, too, So and I've never created a room, so Carol may have to help me walk through that, although so much of this is really... All you got to do is get in there and play with it, and it's kind of self-explanatory. So, But we will all make it there, so if you want to get a hold of me, I will help you um, get into that space when the time comes. And just don't wait until, like, 10 till 6 next Saturday night. I to try to do that. Try to try to set up your Twitter account and get on that ahead of time. We got this. We got it. So thank you guys so much for joining tonight. Thank you, Brittany, for being here. And we will see you guys next week at six o'clock in Twitter space. Thank you, Thank everybody. You, everyone. Love you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you guys. Have a good night. Good night. Good night, everybody. Bye bye.